Hello, good day, and welcome back. Sorry for being away so long. I finally feel like my voice is back um, almost completely that you wouldn't hear it break during this video. So uh, let's do it. All right, so we're going to continue talking about um, loops, okay? And one of the things we're going to start off with is um, the while loop, and then we're going to go into uh, the for loop. And I'm going to cover both in this video. So this video, warning, this video is going to be a little bit longer than um, the previous video. I was going to make two separate videos, but I decided that it makes sense to cover them together. And we'll see if you agree. So let's jump in and talk about looping. Okay, so looping, unlike branching, so when we talk about if statement and the case statement, for example, we're talking about branching. You have multiple paths you want to follow and you have to make a decision either this or this or neither with looping we're saying that we want to repeat right we want to repeat some statement or a set of statements multiple times and then we have, want to have some kind of control over how many times we're going to repeat it and so that's what looping is and we're going to see two types of loop there's another type but the we don't need to cover the do while loop so we're going to just focus on the for loop and the while loop and so in this example you can imagine your program starting somewhere you execute some statements and whatever and then you get to a place where you have to make a decision and you're going to say well i want to definitely loop only if or um, this condition is true and so you can test the condition and if it's true you're going to execute some statement and you're going to go back and test that condition again. That's where your loop comes in, right? Because you execute this, the condition, um, the statement, sorry, if the condition is true. And then you go back. And so long as that condition is true, you're going to keep executing those set of statements. And it might seem like if, what is the purpose of that? Why would I want to, you know, execute the same statement over and over? Now, if the statement is just printing hello world, you know, for, and we're going to do that for example, that seems pretty silly to do. Um, how many times can you print a little world? But if that statement instead is read from a, a line from a file, then do some processing on it, write it somewhere else, then now you can see why you would want to keep repeating that because you want to repeat that until you finish all you know, lines from the file. Or if you read an input from a user, it's going to be you know, keep reading input from the user until they finish typing and you know, read their input, store it somewhere else. Read their input, store it somewhere else. Do they still have more input to read? Yes. Then read it, store it somewhere else. Go back. Do they still have more input to read? Yes. Read it, store it somewhere else. Do they have more input to read? No. Then stop. Um, don't, don't, don't read anything more, right? So um, that's the purpose of um, looping. So hopefully that makes sense. So let's look at the um, while loop. And it pretty much looks exactly as I described. You're going to come to this while statement, a while loop statement, and you're going to test the condition, and if it's true, execute some statements, and then it's going to go back up and keep testing that um, condition. And so long as the condition is true, it's going to keep executing that statement. That tells you right there that if you don't, in, when you execute, you know, when you're inside the loop, so every time you go inside the loop, we call that an iteration of the loop, okay? From statement one to statement n, that's one iteration of the loop. And so if you don't somehow update um, the variables that you're using to test your condition, then what's going to happen is your loop is going to go on forever, as we'll see. So you don't want to do that, right? In this particular case, it's a while loop. And so let's, let's jump to the code and take an example and take a look. So here's my example um, code. And so I have this variable called max messages. I want to print out um, five messages max, and I have a verbal called count, and so I'm going to use that um, in my loop condition, my while loop condition to test to see if count is less than max. So, so long as count is less than max, it means that I haven't printed out enough messages yet. So I say, while count is less than max, you know, count to that log, print a message. Now. The first time I go at line 9 and I test this, count is certainly less than max. It's 0. So 0 is less than 5. So that's true. So I print a message. Now I go back around and I test count again and it's still 0. So this loop is a while loop. It's going to go on forever because nothing happened inside that loop iteration, which means 
in this case, rule federation, um, the statement there is just line 10. Um, nothing happens to change um, or update that condition that would eventually make count not be always less than max messages. So in, what it tells me is I somehow need to update count every time I go through this iteration, okay, so that eventually I will terminate the loop. And so we'll fix that in the next example. And so it, look at this example. The example is exactly the same code as before, except I added a line, line 11, that updates Kong, which makes sense. Every time I print out a message, I should update Kong to say, oh, I printed a message, so I said Kong is equal to Kong plus one, okay? And so I update my Kong to reflect that I have printed out a message, another message. Now, there's a short round for this very thing that, um, because people have used it so often, find themselves counting and incrementing by one, that there's a shorthand that for something like you could type Kong plus plus. But since I haven't explained that in detail, I'm just putting a comment here to show you it. And then when we cover expressions starting in the next set of videos, uh, I'll explain that really. So anyway, so Kong is equal to Kong plus one, which is equal, easy to understand, right? Take Kong, add one to it, so zero plus one the first time, and then assign that result, which is gonna be one, to Kong. So when I go back around again and test my condition, it's gonna be one is less than five, true, come back through, print hello world, and then one plus one is two, store that in count, so now count is two, go back around, two is less than count, and now you can see that each time through my loop, or each iteration of my loop, I'm actually updating count to move closer to that point when I'll uh, eventually have count being five, and once count is five, then, um, you know, the loop would terminate at that point, because when you test it, you say, is five less than five, and that's false, and so it would end. So when you look at the while loop, you may not have noticed that there were really three parts at play. Um, before the loop, we had to make sure so we had the right initialization going so that when we do test our condition, um, it is as we expect, right? And so we did this initialization of Kong equals to zero. Like if we had said Kong equals to 10, then there wouldn't be any point to the code because it would already be, you know, more than how many messages you want to print and that would never execute. So we had to do this initialization or right? had some pretty good idea that how, you know, things were properly initialized before we get to testing our condition. Then there's the whole testing our condition, whatever it is that we want to make sure is true for, you know, to execute the loop. And then, of course, like I said, showed we had to be updating this because if we don't, then we end up just um, never moving to a point of terminating the loop. So there's this initialization, the condition, the test, right? The condition test, and then the update. Those three parts kind of go together for, for the loop. And so keep in mind these three parts when you think about any while loop or for loop, okay? And next thing we're gonna talk about um, is for loop. I think that's pretty much enough that we need to say for while loop for now anyway. We'll get back to it later on. So um, the for loop looks pretty much like the while loop. And if you remember what I just said, keep it in mind for any loop, you want to think about the initialization, the variables that you need to initialize, that's going to you know, participate in your condition test, the condition, and then the update. For the while loop, you have to put your initialization before, then you had your condition in the while loop, and then somewhere inside the, the iteration, you did your update. The for loop makes it kind of more explicit what you're doing. And so it has the three parts like tucked to right there in up front so you can kind of see what's going on. And so you don't really need to worry about doing the update within the loop iteration because the for loop will do that update statement for you. So you're still going to put an expression, sorry, an expression there for update. It's just that the for loop is going to make sure it calls it for you. And the best way to see this is to actually just look at some code. So let's go look at the example. So let's look at an example um, of some code for a loop in use. And you can see those three parts that I mentioned, the initialization for the loop and the condition test and uh, test condition and the update for your, updating your condition variable. And like I said before, the for loop takes care of um, calling that expression you put there at the end of the loop. So you can imagine the way it operates is first, it executes the initialization, then it checks the condition, and if that's true, then it, it does an iteration. At the end of the iteration of the first iteration, it goes and it executes the last part of the for loop, um, 
the, the update, and then it goes back to testing the condition. And if that's still true, then it does another iteration, then it updates, then it goes back to testing the condition, and back and forth like that until um, the condition is no longer true. Um, now, we're going to see that there, there are all these parts of the for loop are actually optional, so you can leave out any one of them. Um, but before we take a look at that, um, it's best to try and just understand it way in the formal way before you start, um, formal structure before you um, try to understand it with parts missing. And so I suggest you look at it and play with the code and see it run. Okay, so let's talk about a, a pitfall or a potential pitfall with a for loop. And as you know, I said parts, um, certain parts are optional, but before we look at that, Let's look at if you were to update your conditional variables or the variables you use for your test condition multiple times. And you can do it because remember the for loop has this place where you can have an expression that does the update. But what if you were to actually do the update also within the loop iteration? And so just as you did in the while loop, remember with the while loop, you had to do it inside the loop iteration, else our while loop just went on forever and ever. And so you might actually want that, but I don't think most people have ever seen code where it actually makes sense to do that. And so let's look at an example if you were to forget or do something that what could happen. Here we're updating count inside the loop itself, the iteration, after putting out the output. And we're also updating it um, where the update expression for the for loop um, occurs. And so what happened is for each iteration, count really is going to get updated twice. And to see it, let's just walk through it. At first, count is initialized to zero. Then the for loop tests it and see that count zero is less than five, so it goes in and it prints count is equal to zero. Then we update count to one. Then the for loop itself call that other expression again, which is count is equal to count plus one, which makes count two. Then it tests count against um, in our expression in the middle there, and we see count two is less than five, and so it run again um, the statement within it does an iteration, which prints out two. And then count is updated to three, then get updated by the for loop to four, and four is less than five. So it goes in again, count is updated to five, then get updated again to six. And at this point, um, six is not less than, is, is six less than five is false, and so it ends. But you see, our thing skipped, and that's probably not what we wanted. If we actually wanted something like this, where it updates uh, for each iteration by two, we could simply do count is equals to count plus two and we could get it to skip the way we want without it being this way, which is kind of harder to follow. And like I said, most of the time, if somebody do, did want something like that, where it skip us, uh, for each situation, it, it jumps sort of like by two or by three or by four or whatever, you'd simply make that in the expression uh, when you update your variable that it did something like that in one place as opposed to trying to do it in two places. It's just harder to track down that way. So be sure you don't do anything like that. So I mentioned so, um, for the for loop, um, different parts of it are, um, all the parts of it are actually optional. So let's take a look at that. And we're going to call this the variation um, for the for loop. And so this really provides you some flexibility when you want to initialize, when you want to perform your tests, and when do you want to perform your updates, since you can change any, um, you know, decide which one of those to put in there. So the first example here, we're going to pull the initialization out of the for loop and put it back before the for loop, just like we, as we did and we had it in the case of the while loop or the case in the, or you would need to do it for a while loop. So our for loop almost looks like a while loop, except it still have the update. But then look at the second example here, um, example um, six. Here we kept the initialization out, we pull out the update and put it at the bottom inside the iteration itself, just like the while loop. So our for loop look exactly like a while loop. I mean, you literally just have to change for to while and take out those two semicolons. By the way, you need the semicolons. If you don't put the semicolons, the for loop doesn't know which part you have in there or which part you don't have in there. So even if a part is missing, you need the, the semicolon to kind of delimit what you have, okay? So even if a part is missing, always put the two semicolons and then put or leave out whichever part you want. And so that's um, some variation. Now we can go further and actually take out all three. And we'll talk about that next. So um, there's a variation of it. Um, I hope that makes sense. Again you know, play with it, test it, try it out, ask questions. Next thing we're going to look at is how you can skip an iteration in a loop. And so you can imagine that uh, you have this loop set up and then maybe you're going to read something in a file 
let's say you're reading content from a file. Let's say it was records. Record, each record represented um, a person's name, how much they got paid, where they lived, and so on, and their address. And all you need to do is read records from the file and only process those records for people with the last name A, for example, which begin with the letter A. And so if you find a record that didn't have a last name A, you would skip it, right? You don't want to go through the, you'd read the record, but you don't want to go through the other steps of processing it. So um, this is an example of where continue comes in, the keyword continue. So here's a um, piece of code in example seven here, where we're going to loop around um, for 10 times. But if we see that the count value is two, five, or eight, and of course we're going to reintroduce our switch statement here to try to simulate like if we find a particular situation where we didn't want to continue processing or put the message in our case, we'll just say continue. And remember from what we said, if your case statement, if you didn't put a break, even if I put continue there, it would go back up to the top, but it's really good um, practice to always put that break because if you don't put a break, somebody might come and change that continue statement to something else and then it would end up falling through. So I always always put that break there, even if like the continue statement would force it to actually, it would literally force the loop to cut short and go back up to the top and t test another one, right? And so with continue there, it's actually gonna still do the count um, because remember the update um, occurs for the for loop at the end of um, doing the statements, it does it automatically. So even when you do a continue, the for loop doesn't skip doing that update at the end. Um, so it's just as if the loop, the iteration ended early. Um, so anyway. So that's how the continue operates, and um, there ain't too much more I can say about it. Um, again, if you find it too difficult to understand, um, play with it a little bit, ask questions, and I could try and come up with some more examples. Okay. Finally, we're going to talk about infinite loops. And I'm going to show you two forms of infinite loop, um, using the while loop and the for loop. And um, so we might think, why would we want an infinite loop? When we started off looking at the while loop, it looked like an infinite loop was a bad idea because we didn't update or count until we kept printing out hello world, hello world, and they would just go on literally forever. So long as your computer had power, you can leave that and, with, and the computer is working. I guarantee you, if the world was around a billion years from now and you had power and your computer would still work, that program would still work. There's nothing there to stop it from running literally from the computer failing to work. Um, so that's an infinite loop. So if we didn't want it then when we first started about a while loop, why am I reintroducing it now and saying that, oh, a while loop is actually a thing that you should understand and you might come in handy. Well, here's the thing. There's this keyword called break. And just now we introduced the keyword called continue, which allows us to kind of skip over and cut the iteration short and kind of go back. Um, you know, start over the iteration, but of course still doing the count. Of course, if you use continue with a while loop and you didn't update your variable, well, you know, it's gonna be a problem. So you t need to test that, right? With the for loop and continue, your update part of the for loop is gonna get called, just mentioning that. But here for the while loop, we have break. And what break allows to do is to say, set up the loop like a while loop, uh, uh, infinite loop, as you'll see what I look like um, here um, in this code that I'm showing right now. And so for while loop, for example, you can say while true. And remember, if the condition is true, it's always gonna keep executing this loop. So there's absolutely not to stop it from um, getting out of this loop. But we're gonna do a test somewhere in the loop, and it might be something that we, some external condition we have to test to see what happened. Like the user inputs something that says Q, that says quit. Um, until the user inputs that, we just keep going and we don't know how long that is. So hence we have to set up this loop this way because we don't know how, many, how long it will take the user or how many tries we will take them to get it right. Maybe we have to process input from a file and sometimes the file is 10 lines long or sometimes a thousand or a million line long. And so since we don't know from upfront how long it is, we're gonna set up a while loop and then we're gonna test. If we reach the end of the file, break. If not, just keep reading input from the file and processing them. And you can see for the for loop, the way you do an infinite, infinite for loop is just literally by putting the two semicolons there. Because remember I told you, you need them there. And you just take out everything. And again, you use a break statement and you use an if to test it. Now, it doesn't have to be an if. It could be something else. Now, somebody might say, well, that if statement there, why can't we just put that as our condition? You could. But generally, when you do a infinite loop, um, the reason for breaking out might not be as simple as, oh, I read a cue from the user, a quick cue from the user to quit, or some other thing to quit, 
or I reach the end of a file. It might be multiple things, conditions that you are testing. Imagine that um, you have to test if you get a quit from the user, if a record was bad, if a record, um, you know, uh, if you, 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 you process up to a million records or uh, any other thing. If the place you're storing it filled up, if you can't put any more in, in the place where you're trying to write it to. So a number of different conditions might cause you to want to exit the loop and not continue. And so your condition would be, could be really, really long. And um, we haven't tested how you do multiple conditions. All the tests we have done so far are sim single, simple conditions. And so that's going to come next when we start talking about expressions. But in that case, you might want to do an if statement or a case statement and say, if any one of these conditions are met, then we kind of break out. Okay? Um, so I hope uh, you really get to uh, learn something and you appreciate and you're pretty, getting pretty excited about these all, new, all these new capabilities. We've been adding on to our basic skills of different data types and then functions and then you know, doing branch um, loop, um, control flow using branches, that's an if and your case, and then now control flow using loops, you know, for and while loops. And we're going to keep adding on to it, but I hope that you start seeing now that oh, you have more and more tools in your tool belt to write increasingly, increasingly better and better program and more sophisticated programs. And at the same time, we're still introducing one or two concepts at a time, and I hope that I'm doing them simply and in enough detail for you to understand them. I'm not giving you every single detail about each concept because you're going to learn that over time. All right? And I'll cut this video, this video here. Take care. See you in the next video. Bye.